So how was this blood biomarker discovered? Uh, Limpro biomarkers were discovered uh, by Dr. Thomas Arendt at the University of Leipzig. Uh, he was one of the original uh, scientists who identified that cell cycle dysregulation was occurring in the brain of Alzheimer's patients at autopsy uh, by identifying certain CDK markers that were upregulated inappropriately. Uh, and then he hypothesized, because there were some inflammatory markers that were also upregulated, that there was potentially an immune deficiency that was occurring. Um, so he did some work and uh, identified that peripheral blood lymphocytes had similar uh, cellular machinery, cell division machinery to neurons, and could potentially serve as a proxy for neuronal uh, activity related to cell cycle. Uh, and, uh, you know, fortunately, after he conducted those experiments, uh, it worked. And so that's where the original 2001 Neuro Report publication comes from. So that's the mechanism of action in the ZIP biomarker? Yes, cell cycle dysregulation is the mechanism of action in this biomarker. But what are the sensitivities and specialties to detect Alzheimer's? Well, that's a very interesting question and one that I think is plaguing the field, not with our biomarker, but generally. So um, as I think we all know, Alzheimer's is really only truly detectable uh, with 100% uh, confirmation at autopsy. Uh, because autopsy is not a good time to diagnose, uh, we're trying to find a proxy for autopsy to have a diagnosis. Uh, right now, the best proxy that we have is something called the uh, amyloid beta scan. Uh, where we use an F18 imaging agent to identify uh, where, basically, you are in your amyloid deposit. And if you're amyloid positive, you have a possible Alzheimer's, and if you're amyloid negative, you, you definitely don't have Alzheimer's. Um, and so, uh, right now, that is the second proxy. Um, so, the third thing to understand is that there was a, a long-term longitudinal study done by uh, the National Institutes of Health and a couple of other groups that identified that physicians who diagnose Alzheimer's disease in life are accurate only about 70% of the time correlating with autopsy. So the challenge in developing biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease is that you have to use in life proxies for something that you don't really have certainty about until death. So uh, the way that we're doing that is we are now looking, one, to see how close can we get to what is generally accepted as a physician's diagnosis. So in a Beach et al. paper published, I think, in 2010, they went through uh, over a 1,000 subjects, uh, some with Alzheimer's diagnosis, some without Alzheimer's diagnosis, and identified about 70% sensitivity and specificity for a physician's diagnosis. Now, when you add an amyloid imaging scan to that, the sensitivities and specificities obviously go up because you have a, a better understanding, a better proxy for death. Um, and so our data shows that we have about 70% specificity and 70% sensitivity related to clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Now, we don't know which 70% of our sensitivity uh, is active to the death cohort. We only know that it's similar to what we see in the uh, clinician's diagnosis. So now what we're doing is we're moving from our 70% sensitivity and 70% specificity, which is similar to uh, what we've identified with the uh, autopsy confirmed physician's diagnosis, and we're adding amyloid imaging. Uh, and to the extent that our sensitivities and specificities go up if we have amyloid imaging scans confirming the diagnosis. This in turn would mean that we are measuring a true proxy of disease. So right now, um, we the data that we presented in our multivariate analysis was a 76% sensitivity, 70% specificity, and we're excited with that because we know the reference standard the clinician's diagnosis is not 100%. And so to the extent that we had been 100%, we would have known that we would, you know, made mistakes relevant to autopsy. So going forward, our challenge, and I think the challenge of the field, 
is to see, one, where are you with respect to clinician's diagnosis? And then two, if you add on additional markers, such as biomarkers uh, related to amyloid imaging, if you improve the sensitivity and specificity, that means you're trending in the direction of a confirmation of an autopsy diagnosis. And, you know, this is obviously a lot of work, it's challenging, but it's exciting because this may, for the first time, uh, based on a fundamental disease mechanism that we know exists in Alzheimer's disease, Winpro could be a proxy for uh, an autopsy confirmation. And so that's exciting. Uh, you know, there's obviously more work to be done uh, in this regard, but certainly we're very excited with that. How efficient would it be, do you think, with uh, in combination with uh, amyloid uh, imaging? Well, you know, that's a difficult question to answer. I think if we can get something into the mid-80s, uh, I think that would be a home run for the field. Uh, I think that would be a grand slam. Uh, if you can get something in the mid-80s that has moved uh, the sensitivity and specificity of the clinician's diagnosis towards the sensitivity and specificity of a clinician's diagnosis plus PET, um, and, you know, you're, you're doing this in blood, uh, we we think, and I think everybody in the field uh, believes that that would be a home run, and so we're we're excited about that prospect. So it would need to be done with another biomarker to increase uh, increase accuracy. Well, so that is only in the investigational stages, um, and let me let me understand what we're trying to do here is see if Limpro identifies true Alzheimer's disease by its, on its own. Right now, that's a challenge because that can't be done until death. So what we're doing is we're piggybacking on studies that were done already by several other groups, including Eli Lilly, where they did many studies that demonstrated their sensitivity and specificity against death, right? So what we're trying to do with Limpro now is show concordance to those other markers. Uh, and if we can, um, we think that, you know, the reality, and we've said this many times, is that initially what's going to happen is this will be used as a surrogate marker, uh, you know, an interesting exploratory marker that will add some value, uh, which maybe could be a pharmacodynamic marker, depending on the mechanism of any drug activity that you're looking at. And uh, over time, could move from an exploratory adjunct to a uh, gating item before you do a PET, so you would take a Limpro assay, and if you test Limpro positive, then you would do a PET for a confirmation. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we think that if this is truly accurate, then we wouldn't need a PET, that this would be a standalone diagnostic. Uh, but for the time being, uh, you know, we're going down the path to make that happen, to understand uh, the biology and move it in that direction. And it's exciting, uh, but we can't yet say uh, whether it will be a standalone or whether in combination. But I think the trend, and as we've seen with everything else, is clinician's diagnosis. Then when PET became available, it was clinician's diagnosis plus PET. Uh, we think that clinician's diagnosis plus PET plus Limpro is going to be the best. Um, at some point, it could just be clinician's diagnosis and Limpro um, if we get sufficient data to justify that. Um, I don't think you're ever really going to take the physician out of the equation. I think that's unlikely. Um, so you're at least always going to have a clinician's diagnosis and then a confirmation with a blood test. And if everything goes to your expectations, when would it be available for the, pub the, the public? So our business strategy is actually to make it available to the public uh, as soon as possible. And we're going to do that in the United States through something called the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments, or, or CLIA. Um, so <clears throat> we believe the market for uh, a diagnostic for Alzheimer's is first in the investigational setting where pharma companies were seeking to get greater understanding that the patients enrolled in their trial actually do have a biology of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there's about $150 million spent on, on making those determinations annually. That's the first market. Obviously, the second market is the commercial market, which is a, a massive, you know, potentially $3 billion market. Uh, the way you get through that ultimately is in the FDA. Uh, but before you get to the FDA, you can use CLIA to start to generate additional data um, as well 
as uh, get it out into the hands of physicians and let them start using the assay and understanding how they how they're going to use it. So, uh, we intend to make this test available uh, as soon as possible, as early as the end of this year or very early next year. Oh, this is pretty soon. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, you pretty much responded to this earlier, but how will this change clinical practice? Well, I think it's going to change clinical practice. It's going to be an evolution. Um, you know, for ultimately successful, um, where uh, you're going to have a much higher degree of certainty when your physician gives you a diagnosis that you do in fact have Alzheimer's. Uh, right now, you know, there, there are a couple of key things that just don't happen very much. Uh, PET is great, but it's not widely available. So, the thing to understand is even though PET is out there, PET may be FDA approved, PET is not reimbursed, and there aren't it's not as if there are tons of PET imaging centers throughout the country that could scan the millions of people who would be required to be scanned to get confirmation of Alzheimer's. So a blood test is obviously a much better solution. Um, so you know, our strategy, how we think about this, is that this test will be made available to the market ASAP, and it's going to tra change clinical practice first on a rule basis. So if you have you know a very low LIMPO score. Uh, even if it looks like you may have dementia, um, physicians may look at a secondary diagnosis, maybe frontal temporal lobe dementia or some other dementia, um, as a potential cause for, for your dementia. And, you know, looking at secondary things as opposed to just stamping it Alzheimer's is very important because there are several other dementias that are potentially treatable um, if a physician would look at them. But most dementia is related to Alzheimer's disease, and so many physicians just make that as a, a diagnosis of default. Um, so, you know, having an objective marker that could really improve the accuracy and at a minimum give you a rule out Alzheimer's. So if you're a negative, then they would move you down to see if you have something else. And in a true ultimate fashion, be a rule in, and that if you are lympho positive, you're certain that you have Alzheimer's. So that's, that's a major fundamental change to clinical practice. Since so, when have your company been working on Limpro? So we in licensed Limpro uh, at the very end of 2012 uh, from a group that did a lot of the, uh, not the original work, let's call it the interim work. They published the 2012 Steeler et al. paper on Limpro. Um, so that they worked on it from about 2004 to 2012, and we uh, took it in 2012 to take it to the next phase of commercialization. Um, so it's been about two and a half years. What was this company? Uh, it, was, the company. it was a company called uh, Provista Life Sciences. And uh, finally, how do you feel about these results? Uh, we feel great. Uh, we're very excited. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. You look at the um, the evolution of our data set as we've gathered more and more patients. We started off, I think, correctly, um, going with a mod severe patients. <clears throat> the reason for this was that's the cohort that has the highest uh, likelihood that a clinician's diagnosis would in fact turn out to be Alzheimer's disease because the later you are in the process, you know, the more demented you are, the higher likelihood that it's not another dementia which may not get you as demented as Alzheimer's disease. And so that we had, I think, mid-80 results. So that's with a cohort of patients that are much more likely to have Alzheimer's disease. And as a result of being more likely to have Alzheimer's disease, Limpro appeared to have a higher sensitivity and specificity. Then in the second part of our study, we added early stage patients. Uh, and early stage patients, by definition, are less demented. And because they're less demented, there are potentially more causes for that dementia outside of Alzheimer's disease. So if you look at the uh, historical data set, you would see that you know very late patients, you don't really need uh, any other biomarkers. You know there's a high 90 plus percent certainty that you know a patient would have Alzheimer's if they're kind of late stage. If they're mid stage Alzheimer's, um, that certainty drops, um, where you're less certain they have Alzheimer's disease because you know there are other dementias that can get you to be that demented. Uh, and in early stage, well, it's much murkier uh, because there are many dementias, many things that can cause you to be demented. Um, and so as our data set evolved, 
we had a high degree of sensitivity and specificity in the cohort that has a much higher likelihood of having, eventually have an autopsy confirmation in the moderate to severe. In the earlier stage patients, we were less sensitive and specific uh, because we feel those patients are less likely to have Alzheimer's uh, at autopsy confirmation. Uh, and so our numbers went from mid 80s, uh, high 80s to mid 80s, and then into the 70s with the group. And now uh, what we're looking to do is to push those numbers back up into the 80s once we add PET to the reference standard. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting, we're measuring the same biology, right? So our results are our results, but the clinical reference against which our results are being measured is what's evolving, and that's what's changing the numbers. Uh, and so, you know, it's exciting to see that it's moving in the direction of autopsy confirmation, both mild to moderate, then, sorry, in moderate to severe, then in the mild cases, uh, and now we're going to go back and look at both of those data sets with the uh, PET confirmation. Uh, and, you know, if those results hold, and if we do in fact have higher sensitivity and specificity after looking at PET confirmation, then the obvious next step is for us to move into the MCI cohort, because then we will know that we're measuring a biology that is in absolutely reflective of Alzheimer's disease, and to the extent that we can pick that up earlier and earlier, um, it's very exciting, because fundamentally the biology uh, we believe is upstream from amyloid, upstream from tau, and so as a mechanistic uh, tool, this is something that could be highly valuable, not only for physicians, but certainly for pharma companies to understand how their drugs are working on a fundamental disease biology. So do you think that eventually LIMPRO could enable early diagnostic? Yes, absolutely. So our, that, and that's actually an important part of our strategy. Um, you know, the field of Alzheimer's disease is not going to stand still waiting for a perfect assay or a perfect data set because that's, that's not going to happen. Nothing is perfect. The field wants to understand good science, good biology, and the field wants to understand how this science and biology can impact medical and clinical practice. Um, and clinical trials. So, you know, from our perspective, uh, and we've heard this from many pharma companies, um, they want to start looking at this soon. You know, we already have one uh, agreement with a company called Anavex Life Sciences, which presented some excellent data last, uh, this week at AAIC for a Sigma-1 agonist, which again is a mechanism that sits upstream from amyloid. Uh, we're collaborating with them. Uh, to identify whether their drug has a mechanistic activity on our assay, and we're going to be helping them uh, look at the design of their phase slash three study and the potential use of limb products, exploratory markers there. There are several other companies after seeing our results, uh, there's interest in potentially using this. And so, you know, going forward, we think that this will build and continue to build uh, into the second half of the year. So the re reactions were positive in Washington. Yeah, absolutely. Even though it, it's interesting, you know, we presented some data uh, last year at AIC. I think that that really got people's attention. They started to follow. You know, a lot of companies we got under CDA. We started talking to them. Um, they wanted to understand more about the biology, the mechanism, the analytical performance. You know, the reproducibility of the assay. So we went back and obviously did a lot more work um, in the second half of the year and the first part of this year to, to answer some of those questions. Um, and this year at AIC, um, we had many, many, many of these companies come back, as well as several new companies, and be very enthused to see that, in fact, you know, the data in, mild to, in the moderate to severe was in the mid-80s. They hypothesized that if we were measuring real biology, that those numbers would go down when we went into the early stage patients, and in fact, that's exactly what happened. And now, by adding PET, if those numbers go back up, then we know you know, beyond the shadow of any doubt that we're really measuring something of interest. And so for us, that's exciting. And for, uh, you know, the pharma companies, that's exciting because now, finally, they may actually have a peripheral marker they can use that is, you know, can, be, can actually become a product that could be reimbursed and distributed widely. And that's really what's required in Alzheimer's disease just because of the size of the population.